Well, I'm glad each of us are online tonight. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak to you once again. If you would like to follow along, we'll be in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. In John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42, we find of the account of Joseph of Arimathea taking our Lord's crucified body. He received permission from Pilate to do this. And then we see in these verses that both he and Nicodemus prepared the body of Jesus for burial. We find that they used a mixture of aloes and myrrh as they wrapped the body of Jesus in preparation for being buried. And they went on to bury the body of Jesus in a new sepulcher in the garden, which was near the area where he was crucified. And this is how the 19th chapter of John closes. This will lead into our text. Again, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. I'd like to read that right now. It says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. We see from these verses that Peter enters the tomb first and sees the linen garments which wrapped the body of our Savior. Later, John also enters the tomb, and he also sees the garment and says he believed. Yet there is one garment in particular that we're interested in tonight, and that is the napkin which covered the head of Jesus. The napkin and its significance. I'd like to talk about that for a few moments. First off, let's define some terms. In verse 7, the word wrapped is used. This is the Greek word intoliso, intoluso, and it means to roll up, wrap together, to entwine, or to be folded. Thus, this burial napkin was used for Jesus, was found folded in the tomb. What would the significance of this folded napkin be? You see, in Jewish custom, the servant or servants, plural, would prepare the table for their master to dine. They would prepare the meal. They would lay out the various utensils for eating specifically for their master. The master would eat while this servant or servants would wait. Once the master was finished eating the meal, he would wipe his mouth, fingers, even beard, and wad up the napkin and toss it on the table. This would indicate to the servant that he had finished his meal and was completed at the table. At this point, the table would be cleared. However, if at any point throughout this meal, the master got up and left the table and yet was not finished eating, he would indicate this 
by folding his napkin and laying it upon the table by his utensils. If this actually occurred, the servants would know not to clear the table. This simple gesture told the servant or servants that the master would come back to finish his meal. Thus, a folded napkin told the servant that the master would return and signified that that servant ought not disturb the table, nor what was on the table. Now, we often sing a song standing on the promises of God. With this folded napkin, we find one of those promises. And we, we heard last week about Jesus being our Savior and Master. So I'd like to kind of combine some of those concepts as we proceed through this lesson. Now, this folded napkin indicates two things. It indicates life. This folded napkin indicated the life of Jesus. What do we mean by that? It was a burial garment wrapped around his head. Yet when the napkin was found, it was folded in order to be folded, someone had to have folded it. Jesus was no longer in the tomb. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 7, the angel here gives testimony regarding this event. It says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Again, Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. We see through scripture that Jesus appeared to his apostles. He would later appear to over 500 brethren. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 8. Jesus was even pictured in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, for his concern for Stephen. He was, he was pictured standing by the throne of God. Later, Luke would record the account of Saul of Tarsus. Later, Paul, when he saw Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. There it says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The risen Savior was seen by many to be alive. This has been recorded for our benefit today. For we do not serve a dead Savior, we serve a living Savior. So again, this napkin, this folded napkin indicated that Christ was alive. And of course, he is alive. But it also indicates a promise. It indicates the promise of Christ's return. This simple gesture indicates that he would, in fact, return. He told the apostles that he would go prepare a place for them. Because he was to do this, he would return in order to gather those who are found faithful. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He pointed to the fact that no man at the time knew he would return. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 51. And Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 37. We do not know when he's he is set to return. No one can know when he is going to return. However, we do know that he will return. We do not know when, but we are found, we are given assurance of the fact that he will return. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul records, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others have which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We find in this passage of 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, that the Holy Spirit, through Paul, tells the Thessalonians and us today that Christ would return. We will recognize this event by the shout of the archangel. It's not an event that you can conceal. You will know that it's occurring and that the faithful will meet our Lord in the clouds. He is never going to set, for, set foot on this earth again, but we'll gather with him in the air. And then these words are meant to comfort those Thessalonian brethren, and they should be of great comfort to any Christian today. So as we conclude, we must keep in mind that each of us are servants. Faithful members of the church, are servants of Christ. Unfortunately, the, mass, the, the vast majority of people today are servants of Satan, but they're still servants. No servant has the right to alter the table while the master is away. The master approves of the setting of the table, and while that master is away, no servant has the right to change anything that is on that table. Jesus is our Savior and our Master has set the bounds for us to follow. And as servants, we are expected to follow those bounds, to stay within them. And as servants, we have no right to alter those things which he has set forth in his word, such as the church, the body of the saved, the terms of pardon which are extended how pardon is extended to those who are lost in sin, the organization of the church, even the very doctrine which the church must uphold, and members in particular, and on and on we could go. These are, these are different aspects which no servant has the right or authority to alter. And finally, in Matthew chapter 24, 44 through 51, we referenced this passage earlier, but I would like to read these verses at this time. Matthew 24, verses 44 through 51 says, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find do so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that, is, that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus has promised his return. This has been further reiterated by other points of Scripture. Therefore, we who are his servants must await his return with patience, and must be working to be prepared in order to be found faithful to him when he does return. I hope this lesson has been beneficial. I thank you for your attention.